All right, Hugh Robertson, tell us uh, tell us a bit about yourself, bro. Um, well, I'm a I'm a stand up comedian. Um, been doing that coming on like four years. I started like late 2016. Um, and yeah, I just been I don't know. I don't really have any credits. Like I haven't really done that much shit yet. You know what I mean? Like I've just been doing like open mics and um, just chipping away at stand up comedy. And this year, because I can't geek that much because uh, of because of COVID, so I've just been focusing on my um, on my online presence. So I'm a semi, sort of semi, semi famous TikToker now. I got like 90K or whatever on fucking TikTok. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is just a fucking meme with, within itself sort of thing. Like, how did you uh, build so, that up? Well, it was weird because like I spent, that was kind of my project over like the last, probably started actually legitimately going hard on it, maybe like March. And I, I built up like 9,000 followers up until like maybe beginning of August. And then I was posting like a few sort of risque shit on TikTok. And then my account got banned. And I was like, re- I was pretty cut for like, because yeah. I, you know, I put a lot of work in, into getting that, those numbers. And then um, I was like, all right, well, I got to start again. And... I was like, all right, well, I should address that I've lost my account. Like when I make my new account and I should make a video about it. And then I was like, well, why don't, why don't I make a fucking song? You know what I mean? <laughs> so this little like 15 minute sort of jingle, sorry, 15 second jingle. Um, it was like, how the fuck did it go? It was like 15 minute know, jingle. That was on 9K. It got reported. TikTok said, no way. We're banning you. We don't care what you say, but I made a new account, so it's okay. You can follow me. That would make my day. So it's real simple. I was just strumming the uke as well. Yeah. And then I put that up, and I remember I was actually emotional when I put it up because I was like, I pulled my fucking heart to it, and I was just like, this is a new beginning sort of thing. And like, um, yeah, I was still mourning my old account. And then I put it out, and then within like, two days or something i had like twenty thousand followers like the like the fucking blew up yeah yeah um and it was like most of the kids and shit it was kind of funny it was like <laughs> you know how people will like actually think the tiktok audiences like it's like eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds and shit yeah. it was actually my audience <laughs> <laughs> on my old account i was just doing like um like nrl controversy videos like it was <laughs> just like and i was shitting on netball heaps and just like um but yeah so i got like this whole new audience and then i just been kind of chipping away and um i had another video sort of go pretty viral maybe like with jfk yeah 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 the jfk video that was like a trend it was like a trending sort of sound and the dance was already like a thing but um for those that don't know it was just like this audio that had like a gunshot in the middle and no one was really using the gunshot. They were doing the dance, just like pointing the, doing the gunshot at the, at the camera. I was like, well, why don't I fucking mix that up? And I was thinking like, uh, who the fuck can I shoot? <laughs> <laughs> In my video, who can I shoot? And I'm like, well, fuck it, let's shoot JFK. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, that video went fucking, went like everywhere. Like I, I don't have Twitter, but a few people sent me links to where it was like reposted on Twitter and like, it's a couple of places it got like over a million views and yeah it got Damn. like this meme page I, I follow on instagram i was like it's crazy so i got a ton of followers from that um so yeah, yeah. i've seen that dude when when um your account first got uh deleted because you were already getting a bit of traction i was like oh fuck he's getting like 10k followers he's doing yeah. all right and then it got deleted and i was so interested into how you'd respond Cause like, yeah. I mean, I've only met you a couple of times, but I was just pretty sure that he was going to, you were going to do something to rebound. I didn't <laughs> think that you would fucking just be like, Oh, I got deleted. I guess that's it. And yeah. I was so interested. And I just, I put the, the notifications on to see what you'd be doing. And then you made that first video and dude, the next day I checked it and I had like well over 200,000 views. I'm like, what the fuck? And then next week I'm like, dude, this guy is actually taking off. And now you're like, <laughs> literally like a hundred K followers over a million likes. And like now your Instagram's starting to transfer as well. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is sick. Like you didn't, it's only, a, maybe it's a minor thing to some, but it's just the whole theme of 
like what a player one does. You know what I mean? Like you don't yeah. just step to a setback. You're like, nah, fuck it. Like I'm going to go harder now. And you did. And it was sick. Yeah, it was. And uh, I was thinking as well, cause I was like, obviously I was sad like when the account got de- deleted, but I was talking to one of my, um, my comedy mates, uh, Alessio, Alessio Carducci. I don't, you guys probably, you guys probably met him. Yeah. Alessio is funny as hell. Yeah. yeah. Fuck out. Yeah. No um, but he was telling me, he was like basically telling me, well, it's more important that because my actual, the, the videos I was putting out were getting better and better and better as like anything you do. Yeah. So, and then I realized sort of now after I made that account and I've only, I've probably got, well, I've actually got 10 times the amount of followers my old account had, but we'll probably like a 10th of the videos that I put out. So my quality is a lot higher. And that's because of the skills. And then I was thinking about, there's like fucking big, you know, you guys like Big Sean, the rapper? <laughs> yeah. Sure. There's a line he does in like a Gucci Mane song where he says, um, I used to focus on getting rich, but now I'm focused on getting smart because that's the only thing they can't take away or tear apart. And that line yeah. was like fucking real ringing with me after I made that. Because it's like, I don't, even, even now, if you deleted my account now, I'd rather be where I am. I'd rather have that than have 90,000 followers. Yeah. yeah. The ability to, to communicate funny on, on, on an online thing is way better now. You know? Yeah, true. So now you've got the skill and you can't yeah. take that away. Yeah. 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 So, um, bro, how did, you, how did you get started in comedy? Because if people listening to this don't know, us three yeah. have actually met uh, through, I guess, mutual friends having been going to a few little open mics and seeing a little bit of the comedy scene in Melbourne. It's funny and it's interesting and cool to see how um, it, it's, it's so unique, that little scene, you know, it's like, yeah. you think about the type of characters that, that come through and it's actually like a small kind of world where everyone does kind of, kind of know each other. So through our mutual friend, Bobby, who trains with us at, at Absolute, we went down, ended up jumping on our, ourselves and then just, stick, just started sticking around and coming every week. <laughs> And then I think I remember you two you. going on stage. I remember being fucking really entertained. Like, oh, man. <laughs> do nice you know how that it. came about? Yeah. Like, did, did Bobby tell you how that, like, how that first night came about? Or was um, maybe. No, I don't think he did. It was like, Bobby is fun. He's always been funny as fuck. And then... Fuck it up, what, yeah. Bob, Bobby's... Yeah. It's even in terms of, like, the comedy scene where there's, like, obviously a lot of funny people. Like, he's just... <laughs> I can't fucking hilarious. Like storytelling <laughs> ability is 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 amazing. Yeah. Like if, if, everywhere he goes, it's just it's always humor and funny to the point where yes. it's like annoying. You you got you got to monitor how I gotta <laughs> monitor how much I spend, how much time I spend with him. <laughs> but he called me up. I I just finished. Um, I lost my license for the second time. <laughs> Josh and I lost it a few times. And he called me up and he goes, "Do you want some plans tonight?" And I was like. Uh, what, what kind of plans? Because when he says that, I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, nah, nah, nothing crazy. He goes, I've decided to do stand-up comedy. There's some guy, some guy I spoke to, Adam. And he goes, yeah, there's a place. I'm going to go, I'm going to go jump on and sign up. He goes, I'll yeah. pick you up. We'll go. I'm like, all right, you need some moral support. Pick me up. Let's head down. And then when we're in the car, he starts buckling. And even if, oh, I, hope he doesn't, I hope he doesn't care. Actually, even if he does, it'll be funnier. But he's like, oh, Nah, I reckon we're going to miss it. Let's, let's just go somewhere else instead. You know, it's because it's going to be it's too late now. Like he said, we have to be there by a certain time to sign up. And I'm like, bro, it's probably just like a, a regular thing. You can just, you know, rock up. It's no big deal. Drop in. Nah, yeah. I'm like, bro, we're going. 100% we're going. Then when we get there, he's like, oh, I'm not. Uh, he goes, he said something about not doing it anymore. He didn't want to do it because the sign up had finished. And I go, what do you mean sign up had finished? There's a paper over there. I'm like, bro, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. And I just went and got a pen and put my name down, and I knew that yeah. would spark him to, to do it as well because he gets real competitive like that. Yeah, and, and like, he suggested it. Yeah, and, and then he's let, like, yeah, his competitive spirit is not gonna let someone who didn't even originally have that idea to do it. That that would be burning as well, a so. hole through him. So he he jumped on. He's like, fuck it, I'm doing it. Fuck it, of course I'm doing it. Yeah. Put his name down, and then bang, jumped on, <laughs> banter. But it's been cool seeing how it's progressed from like just jump on and try and be funny to him having to think about things. And then you realize how much of a skill, how much of an actual skill it takes to be a good comic, to be funny. Anyone can be funny in the moment, you know, when the right moment calls, but to jump up on stage 
and then actually have a have a rhythm. There's a rhythm to fighting, also a rhythm to that set on stage. So it's interesting to think about how anyone even gets involved in that. So that's, I guess, Bobby's inception story. How about, how about yeah. yourself having you get to comedy? Well, even, even just to touch on what you said there, like, like the difference between funny and being a comic, it's almost like difference between being an athletic person and being a fighter. Mm. Like, sure, you could be like a great athlete, but yeah, the skill set to, to go with fighting is like completely different. Same, different. same yeah. with comedy. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, it's kind of because my, sort of my, how I even starting getting into stand up is kind of tied into MMA in a weird way. Because okay. I, I, I love stand up comedy growing up and everything. But I didn't really, I never really vibed with anyone that I, that I saw. Um, and then so the journey kind of started, it was maybe like 2015. And I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw like a Conor McGregor video. It was like Conor McGregor, it was like his whole compilation of talking shit to Jose Aldo. And I was like, who the fuck's this kind of like, this, this is incredible. And then that kind of started kicking me off getting into MMA because I didn't really know anything about MMA too at that time. And then I started watching the Joe Rogan podcast and then I was watching that one day and he was, he mentioned this guy called Bill Burr and this bit oh. Bill Burr did called um, Gold Digging Hordes. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> the fuck, what the fuck's this bit? So I looked it up and it's like, it's one of my favorite bits of stand up ever. It's just Bill Burr and he's, it, it was so incredible because he was talking shit about women for like 15 minutes, but making women laugh about it at the same Crazy. time. And I also saw him and I was like, because growing up as a fucking redhead, like an angry fucking, you know, energetic, <laughs> like redheaded cunt, like there's not a lot of uh, representations of that. So mm. I saw Bill Burr and I'm like, that's the same type of guy that I am. So it kind of gave me like sort of permission in my head that I could, I could go um, and do stand-up comedy. So then I just started writing a bunch of like stupid ideas that you have when you first start doing comedy. <laughs> Uh, maybe for like a few months and then I just went to some open mic in Footscray and that was actually that was my first time being in Footscray I've never even been in Footscray before you know? <laughs> so that was the whole, and I was like by myself I think I was living in like Clayton at the time I was I was on uh living at um residential college at like Monash mm -hmm. it was like the train across the city and and I signed up I went on last it was like eleven thirty. it was like four people in the audience one of them was just some shoddy fucking homeless cunt and, and i was like i don't i barely even remember my first it was like a it felt like an acid trip but i was like um yeah let me do that again and that yeah just started doing it more and more and more and bang yeah crazy man that's how it works with everything it's just like whatever that call whatever that call to action is whatever that calling is whatever it is watching something bill burr or just feeling like you want to go give something a shot it's like yeah. one, it's like that's like that domino you know that's like that first domino flick and then yeah that's why it's always cool to look back even in like i guess my own journey with fighting or whatnot i just look back at those beginning moments and it's crazy it shows you it's like a, it's a little domino effect whatever it is and then bang everything just stacks up from there crazy yeah and, and even like your whole life like because even when i got on stage it never really felt like obviously i was nervous but i, I didn't really feel like um crazy nervous because I, I i'd done almost any other type of performance like i i, I played in um like little youth, youth orchestras and stuff i played flute in high school um, <laughs> i was in musicals yeah no one fucking picks that i play flute it's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> i don't really give up the flute vibe you know what i mean <laughs> sorry you put a video of oh, what was that song you put up you were playing on the flute and i was like wait is this guy taking the piss or can he actually play the flute i don't know it was just some irish fucking i think it was like st patty's day yeah yeah yeah. corona was kicking off so i was like all right let me let me spark some joy here you know what i mean <laughs> so i yeah i just googled some some fucking irish flute song or whatever but i'm i'm def i'm very rusty i haven't really like properly played in a good while but um yeah so and i've I done like i always love public speaking and um yeah, I just I just love being the center of attention as well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that, man. Like a lot of people sort of frown upon, you know, like oh, he to he likes to be the center of attention and that, but man, it's like fuck, someone's got to be the center of attention. Yeah. You get a mad rush from it as well, you know. It's just exciting it's because like it's not 
you're the center of attention for a reason because people are paying attention because they like it. You're entertaining them. And yeah. if you're giving that to someone, then what's wrong with that, you know? And if you're not, and if you're uh, on stage and you're being the center of attention and you're fucking it up, <laughs> you feel bad because you go, all right, well, I'm taking this spotlight, but I'm, I'm not really doing anything with it or it's detrimental, yeah. which is yeah. good because then you go off stage and then you have that constant like reassessment process. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what's the comedy scene like? In, in Melbourne at the moment? Um, well, when, man, when I started, it was a little bit fucking like standoffish, to be fair. Mm. Like, I, I kind of felt, um, yeah, there weren't a ton of friendly characters. Um, and, but I feel like it's a lot better now. Like, the, because I probably started, my first one of my good proper f- friends in stand up was, was Alessio. And I feel like we kind of started um, a little crew sort of thing, like with a um, few other people. So I feel like it's a lot more um, sort of accepting now, but then it, it, mm. there's a lot of bitchy aspects. and Yeah, I heard of it. Like, <laughs> like everything, but... Um, it's funny. It's funny how that works. It is. Yeah. It's like it's everyone's just pursuing stupid. something. This is what I, this is kind of the vibe I got from that whole um, comedy scene. It's like, it's brand new and it's a bunch of, of course, pretty interesting, unique characters to even pursue this. You know, it's like when you look yeah. around the, the map at, at, at any gym, you, in particular with the fight team or like a, the crew of people really pursuing it, they're usually pretty unique coming from different backgrounds. There's something that is contributed to them being in that position and dedicating so much to it. Same with comedy. It's just as unique, just as out there. And it's like a bunch of unique characters. But then what happens, I think, is you can either get a little bit hostile to people pursuing the same, the same, the same thing. Whereas in reality, it's like, Josh, with keeping the, the open gym policy, the open door policy. It's like, yeah. um, nothing should matter. Everyone is pursuing the same thing. Like, uh, uplift, raise, try and help everyone. As the level of comedy in Melbourne grows, so will each individual comedy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And like... I remember just when I started, like I'd be doing open mics and I'd be going on like dead last and I felt like I should have been, you know, I'd be like, oh, I've been mm. coming to this room for a year and, you know, we're fucking killing it every time. And <laughs> but in reality, I wasn't killing it. I just thought I was doing really well because your standards are lower when you start. And True. then it's like, yeah. well, if that would put, because that open mics, you want to go on earlier because you want to get the fuck out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, because the, because after like 30 open mic comics, the, the fucking crowd starting to get, you know, like, a low. beating. <laughs> it's a, it can be a bit of a beating. Um, but then I, I guess my attitude sort of shifted maybe like two years ago or something. And it was more like, well, instead of just approaching this with like a negative sort of why am I not getting this opportunity mindset? Why don't I go up on stage and show them why? Mm. I could be, yeah, and just like, and, and even if you're going on stage to three or four people, you can always get something out of it. True. Sure. Always. Always, always. That's, that's the mindset, man. It's not surprising at all like to see. I guess this is maybe just one bigger domino piece falling down. You're getting some, um, some, some, some clout, some social media clout, well-deserved. But yeah. it's no surprise. And I'm not going to be surprised when you get to wherever, wherever you are going to get to with comedy because that's the mindset for everything, you know, for everything. And yeah. hearing you say things, it's, so, it's just so interesting because I guess a little bit of an insight, I have a little bit of, we have a little bit of an insight into comedy, but hearing it, it's, it just makes, it just reinforces that, damn, no matter what vocation or pursuit, it's the same things that get people to the top. It's like, you get in there, you got to hustle, you got to grind. There's, there's just different aspects that are the same in everything. But um, yeah. with the comedy scene, what are the tiers? Like, where do you aspire to get to for yourself? And what, what are the kind of the levels, the pathways out there? Um, where are I aspire? I just want to be, I just want to be a guy who sells tickets. You know what I mean? Like, I just want to have sort of an audience who like fucks with my shit and like, yeah, I can just sell tickets to them. So anything, any, any shows or whatever the fuck, I, any other opportunities, I, that's a blessing, but um, yeah, the tiers are probably like open mics. So that's where there'll probably be like 10, maybe 20 people in an audience just at a bar or whatever. Anyone can go and sign up. Um, and then it probably gets into like, 
you start doing more paid spots. So I started doing that. I remember my first paid spot. Fucking hell, that was incredible. I was, uh, I was just doing my regular like Wednesday spot, my uh, place in uh, Glen Ferry, Gorilla, Gorilla Comedy. And one of the guys who runs it, he just asked me if I wanted to host. I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'll host. And um, I did terribly. <laughs> it's real bad. But I still got like 50 bucks for it. And I just, yeah, I just remember looking at that. I remember coming home and just hold that fucking $50 note to the kitchen light and like crying a little bit. Like, it, yeah, like it's real, real, you know? You can make money from this. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny money. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking sick. <laughs> How <laughs> better than like you could have given me a thousand dollars for doing nothing. That that fifty dollars is way better. Yeah, dude. It's like remember Josh when we had that that first bit of money from the Tiki Tribe store. Absolutely. It's like it's a confirmation that even it's just as small as as it is, it's like damn, what I'm trying to do here can be done. It's like this is real, you know? Yeah. 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 It's just proof. It's proof in your hands. You're like fuck. I can do this. Exactly. And in, a, in a journey where it's so unique and crazy where there's like there's no stages of of proof that you get you know you might have to go and, and just be out there hustling for, for ages without seeing any sort of um reward but then getting that little bit every now and then is like damn okay this is proof that's exactly yeah. way to put it. Some proof that it's like it's it's doable it's working let's go yeah that, that's the thing about comedy like there's no like there's no real treaded, trodden path. Like, mm. I mean, they they kind of used to be with the old media. You sort of, you know, you do stand up a bunch of clubs, then you get on radio, maybe then you get on a show or something. But now, like, because of the internet, like, dude, if you my, if you told me like eighteen months ago I was gonna be like have this many followers on TikTok, I'd be like, what the fuck? What, like, what? I don't know what the fuck that is? You know what, <laughs> I mean? like, what the fuck's yeah. TikTok, bro? Right? Like, so. Yeah, and if you ask me in a year, like, like my, my goal is always just to be, in, always just to be, get better and better and better at stand-up. Like, mm-hmm. that's all I've really worried about. I don't really worry about um, anything else. Because that, that's the only thing you can really control. Dude, oh, fuck. I read this mad quote exactly that was about that. I can't remember how it goes, but it's just, it's the absolute truth with anything that you do. The minute that you start focusing on, some sort of destination or reward that you want out of it, then you take yes. away your craftsmanship. You start spending less time on doing, on like what we're talking about, Sam, you forget about the girl that got you to the dance. Yeah. You get to the dance exactly. and you want to fuck her off, but then you, you didn't get there without her. You got no yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. That's, you got no one now. Yeah. Some ugly chick off Tinny, bro. Fuck no. <laughs> 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 Gotta go to the well. <laughs> But yeah, it's about that. And it's, it's good to see, you know, like it's good to see that you actually genuinely care about the craft because that translates to everyone. Oh, yeah. Dude, I, I, I'm kind of a bit, it's a bit weird now because I don't even really, because um, I'm not actually doing stand-up almost every day. Like, because my kind of, there's so many different writing styles. Mm. Um, as I'm sure there's so many different training styles with fighting, like different approaches and stuff. Like, do you spar hard or do you just um, throw mitts or, you know. Yeah, yeah audio do you, you know what the fuck you do um it's kind of the same with comedy because i know like some guys that, who are like pure like joke writers like i got a good mate james g warren like he's just mm. <laughs> just it writes like multiple hours a day just clean with it just very um clean stand up um but then there's like guys like me who i don't really i don't really write like i kind of just have an idea i'll maybe write some dot points or whatever like the points i want to say and then i'll go on stage and i'll just work it out and then over like night after night after night of like repetition and altering those those bits then i kind of develop an act um yeah i sort of i felt that i felt that when i was watching you um mc at kaz's when i think when we went up and i was like what the fuck man is this guy even like he's just sort of snowballing things and he's sort of picking things out that the crowd's given to him. I think I was yelling some shit out. I don't know what the fuck I was yelling, but yeah, I remember you, um, cause that, that was actually when I met you was when I was on stage. <laughs> yeah, bro. I started yeah. talking to you on stage for some reason. Yeah. And I remember you were saying like, Oh bro, I like, can I get your details? Or like, oh, like, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, bro, you call me gay in front of the crowd. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> But yeah, Josh mentioned to me on that on that same night, like um, like he he pointed you out in terms of humor. Like, damn, that guy was funny as fuck. Which I guess would be a massive compliment for it's it's what you're it's it's what you're there to do. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Any anytime someone tells me I'm funny, I'm like, fuck yeah, bro. Like, <laughs> right, man. You know, what I mean? that's what I'm doing it for. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, hundred uh, percent. I remember I, I gave you this to the station afterwards, and then that was when. Like, we are just chatting some shit about jutsu and you were telling me about the yoga and that. I was like, oh, fuck yeah. Like, you're into yoga. Then I remember following your page and, like, you're actually legit at yoga. I was yeah. like, oh, shit. Yeah, I've been doing that? some... What was that? How long have you been doing yoga for? Um, Maybe, like, three years. Because, like, I... Because I've always been working out. Like, I, I played, so, like, soccer growing up. Um, And then... I actually, I actually did jujitsu for, like, maybe, like, three, four months. I, start, I actually started at the same time I did um, stand-up comedy. But then I was kind of like, which one am I going to focus on sort of thing? And mm. I was like, I really want to be comedian. Um, so I stopped doing jujitsu. And then I kind of just stopped working out for like a year, which I'd never really done. It was, it was a bit odd for me. Mm. And then I can't even remember why. I, yeah, I just looked up a YouTube. Actually, it was fucking Joe Rogan again, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about yoga. I'm like, fuck, let me give it a crack. So I just looked up like a few ones on YouTube and I was like stretching and stuff, like playing soccer, like warming up. I just always enjoyed, um, I just always enjoyed stretch. Yeah, just like trying to, like if we were doing the stretches, like even in PE class and like other people weren't doing it, crying, I'm like, fuck this guy, he's doing it. <laughs> like doing it legitimately. Yeah, like, like um, so I just enjoyed it. And then, yeah, just started doing like little ones of YouTube and stuff. Then I've, um, I've gone to the gym and done yoga a bit. I'm, and I'm, I'm pretty good at it sort of thing. And it's yeah, not that you're, that you're naturally pretty good at. Um, do you have a routine? Do you have a routine for it? Like a, a schedule? You do it every a few times a week? I'll probably do it uh, almost every day. I'll probably do like six six days a week. I just okay, do it for a week out. Because I've, I've been doing this like calisthenics routine. Because mm -hmm. um, after the gym's closed, I was just only doing yoga and I was like, well, I'm not really doing any pool movement because yoga is a lot of pushing. Mm -hmm. There's some blind spots in yoga, which I've kind of discovered. Okay. Um, same with like, they don't yoga. If you go to a yoga class, you don't really do any wrist uh, warm ups. Yeah. Which is massive, which I found with handstands. Fucking wrist, huge, right? Oh my God. That's where all the injuries will come from. Luckily the, the course that I joined up with had a massive focus on, um, wrist mobility and building up exercise. Like part of that whole first phase is just strengthening the wrist to make sure you don't get those injuries when you're doing everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Which I never, I never had any terrible wrist, wrist injuries, thank God. But, um, but yeah, so I, I got these like uh, Olympic uh, gymnastics rings. So I've just been going out to the park during like the last two, three months and um, just using that. I got a little routine and then I do yoga. I come home after that and do yoga and, and meditate um so i do that almost every day um what benefits have you seen from doing it um well i mean aside from like physical benefits of yoga like which i've kind of known about for like the time i've been doing it but i, I didn't really meditate properly until um the quarantine because mm. i lived with a guy like two years ago who was real into that he was like studying biomedicine and meditate like an hour a day. And you could, you could ask him anything about food or like Sam Harris and yeah. um, shit like that. I'd probably say it's weird. A, lot of, a lot of ideas that I'm thinking like for video ideas, they'll kind of, I kind of flesh them out when I'm meditating. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which you kind of, not, I don't know. You're supposed to actually focus on the breath or whatever, but. Um, nah, meditation is, 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 um, is something that, there's no like massive step like format for it. You know, sometimes it's introspective <laughs> and you're thinking, yeah. sometimes it's just about calming. Yeah. It's what I've seen. It's what I've found so far. Yeah. It's sort of like what you need in the moment. Like if you feel that you're pretty centered because you're doing a lot of yoga anyway, or you just don't get caught in your own head, then you probably don't need the breaths as much. Well, I think I, I think I do, but yeah, sorry. I, you asked me questions. I don't fucking go off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now the benefits yeah just the breathing 
like, because I, I love jumping rope as well. Mm. And I've noticed just the fun, when I'm jumping rope, when I'm really flowing, when I'm doing it the best, is when I'm just thinking about my breath mm. and kind of sinking the breath to the movement. Um, yeah. yeah, and then also just, yeah, if I catch myself sort of in a negative thought pattern or like, and, and just my natural, I'm just a naturally defensive person. And yeah. I, I do a lot of, ah, oh, fuck that kind of, like, type of thought. <laughs> I'm just walking down the street. And I'm like, look at this fucking cunt. Look at this cunt's posture. I'm real big on posture. I'm like, fuck <laughs> it's just, And then I catch myself. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm like, I hate this person. I don't even know it. But it's kind of weird because that's part of where my funniness sort of comes from as well. I mm. see. I'm, I'm very passionate about shit that doesn't really matter but kind of does yeah <laughs> like niggly shit Weird. Bro, that's uh that's why i fucking yelled out on stage because i'm like oh are you wog because the way you because wogs are all about the it's either a hundred percent yes or it's no it's the shittest thing in the world and the shit that you were saying i'm like man he's got a real big opinion about this shit that no one would give a fuck about but <laughs> I'm like, oh, you won, bro. And you're like, what? And I was like, oh, fuck, I've got myself into this now. But are you or not? Nah, I just grew up around wogs, really. Uh, I'm an associate of wogs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wog ally, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I, I just grew up playing soccer, so. Yeah. So all. Pretty big, <laughs> yeah, fuck. There's a pretty big wog community in, um, in Canberra, uh, believe it or not. Canberra, is that where you're from? Yeah, I'm from Canberra, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I just moved down here and like most of my mates in the comedy scene are wogs. And um, yeah, I just, I just love wogs, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're hilarious. They don't even yeah. have to be trying and they're just funny as to watch. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I kind of just always found I got along with like ethnic people just kind of pretty naturally. I think I've always sort of felt like a little bit of an outsider because because of, of the red hair shit, a little bit. Yeah. Um. So yeah. And there's no real like red hair community, is it? Like, <laughs> no. There, like, and anytime like we try to set community. one up, cuts just fucking shit on us, bro. <laughs> so a redheaded march like three years ago, and I went to that. I was like, man, this is great. But then it just felt like a little bit of like a, just like a very specific white power rally. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's the white people, bro. Like, <laughs> I know there's some like Egyptian redheads, whatever the fuck. But, um, yeah, but it's so weird because we're not like an actually oppressed group, but it's it's more just like social oppression, like with, with what people say. Damn, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying this to like a fucking dude's half black. <laughs> It never goes down well. But I'm going to this shit to black people. They're like, yeah, you know our history, bro? Like, <laughs> Man, that's hilarious. Mate, comedy is such a, um, it's, it's some, of course, I'm not going to see, it. it's just so interesting to watch the scene, you know, from like, uh, from the outside, you either have never met a comic, but having been to these little open mics and seeing kind of like the grassroots, it's just funny, man. It's, it's, but it's no, it's no surprise that the kind of characters that kind of um, it, it brings up. It's a crazy scene. A lot of and insane like people said, in comedy. <laughs> the, most, like the most cook cunt, the, the biggest concentration of cook cunts I've ever met. Oh, <laughs> and I'm comedy, oh, like legit. So, have, do you have any, uh, have there ever been any situations where like people were too messed up at a gig or, or like any comics were like completely smashed at a gig on stage outside of Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> so Bobby's probably the leading example, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, I did, I did stand up coming off, coming down off mushrooms actually. Okay. How'd that go? Yeah, well, I, um, pr actually su surprisingly pretty good. I, I think I took them that day or like middle of the day. And then I was taking the train to the city and I just randomly started talking to this guy on the train. And then he ended up coming to the show with me, like <laughs> <laughs> to come watch me. Um, and then I, I went on near the end. Yeah. And I had like good set, but it was so weird. Like the stage lights were really like, like fucking me up sort of thing. I was like, kind mm. of, I must've looked a little bit freaky. Cause I was like, oh, oh, uh, on mushrooms and the, and the lights, damn. Yeah, um, I, I did it, 
I haven't really done it in a while, but I've done it stoned and like, yeah. that's a bit just fucking odd. Cause you kind of, I trail off when I'm stoned anyways and you forget what the fuck you're talking about. And, yeah. What was I talking about again? And, <laughs> Man, <laughs> the, best, the best time, like when, when um, Bobby went up one time and, oh no, Bobby, let's just say, let's start, someone else went up one time and it was completely, completely smashed. <laughs> and, I was in a car with these two people beforehand, yeah, and they were, and I was driving. And it's a funny situation: is I am the one that lost my license, so I'm not allowed to drive. But I was the one that had to drive because everyone was too messed up. So I'm driving, <laughs> and then these two people are in the back plotting this, like this mad, this mad set. Like Bob, Bobby's in there, whatever. Bobby's in there talking with um, a friend of ours, and he's like, "This guy has never done comedy in his life, but he's giving Bobby all these like." Um, ideas to like man on stage you do this but because they're both so smashed they both think <laughs> it was like the best ideas that they were coming yeah. up with so then when they finally get there i'm just letting it all run and like, it's gonna be funny as like oh yeah we'll do this we'll do this bit and i'll like chat to you halfway through and then you'll you, like we'll bounce off each other like crowd and person on stage wait this is them planning out the bit on stage <laughs> not necessarily planning it out but but the um the like they had a structure in their head of what they wanted which they completely fucked up anyway but that was where it all started oh then, dude i remember this this was so <laughs> cringy i had to i had then, to wait i was like this like they're both way too way too gone way too gone way too high so then it, the whole thing plays out and it was a fucking it was an did absolute, they both get on stage together no they're no. not on stage together no, no. So they had one on stage and one was in the crowd and he was supposed to like purposely heckle. Oh, set up planned, a joke like planned heckles of fucking like, like, like worse, not bro. heckle. He, 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 um, like he was telling a bit about something to do with, um, I don't know, spiders falling off a tree or something. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then he was supposed to like ask something, you know, and then he had the answer. The person in the crowd had the answer. <laughs> but he got he got too fucked up and he couldn't remember what to say <laughs> oh dude i remember that so clearly crazy oh. man it's funny dude, it's, I, it's I, watched so, it's bobby, so... I watched bobby on stage one time it was at st kilda and his first three minutes on stage he made up this story about how the actual st kilda told him like where to be tonight and what to do and he's like and we're here because of Kilda. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> it's a crack up. It's, it's, yeah. It's so funny how fighting is mixed into, into um, somehow those worlds are tied. There's something similar about both those pursuits. Cause even I was listening to Mike Tyson podcast, hot boxing podcast. And he had on, it was interesting to listen to. He had on uh, some friends of his from when they were kids, but these, these people, Mike became Mike Tyson doing crazy shit, biting ears, winning titles. And yeah. then this guy became a, a comic and became like a, a really good comic. I forgot his name, but he, he gets booked out for shows. It's his, it's his vocation now. And hearing them chat um, was interesting because it's like, again, two people from, from childhood that have known each other and they've both gone in, into, this, in, into these two crazy worlds, you know, and then just created something yeah. out of it. And hearing them talk about it and bounce off each other like different things. And Mike, this comic back in the day was like a complete thief. Like he would steal people's, like his friends watches and shit. Like that's what he was known for. So Mike was bringing it was up. Was that Joey Diaz? No, nah, not, not Joey Diaz. Uh, um, but I'm sure he probably stole some people's watches, but yeah. was, um, <laughs> this, other, this other comic. <laughs> Man, Joey Diaz kills me. No one kills me as much as Joey oh, big Yeah, big time, right? Oh, that he's just like the perfect, perfect example of someone, and I know that, like, I've watched a fair bit. I know he obviously cares about his craft and he writes, but yeah. you just put him in a room with a person and just let him go, and he just fucking has this natural gift of the gab that just floors you. And I'm like, how the fuck do you, how do you even, like, how do you have this skill without even trying? It's just it's energy. And like, I mean, obviously, a lot of repetition. Like, he's just done it. He's been doing comedy, like, almost 30 years. Um yeah. But yeah, his story is really interesting because it's like, I don't know, you hear how, how bad it's sort of his life was. Like he went to prison and mm. it was just fucked up. And then he came out and it's like, well, he's got this talent of being a funny cunt. Well, why don't I, why don't I convert that into an actual skill, which is like being a comedian? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, 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 you were saying, Sam, with like the, 
the parallels between like being a martial artist and comedy. I think it's just, it just comes down to like, it's just the, it's a journey sort of both of them. It's like a journey in, into yourself mm. sort of thing. Cause like when you're in a fight and you're sparring or whatever, you get punched in the face. There's no hiding from that. Mm. Which it's, it's the same with comedy. Like if you fucking bomb, no one laughs. Well, what are you up there to do? Kate? You're there to make them laugh <laughs> and you fucking did it. So something went wrong and you can blame like any other, anything else you can blame external factors or, I don't get enough sleep, the crowd was shit, the MC didn't bring me on correctly. You know what I mean? They don't get me like, no, at the end of the day, like if, if a legitimate pro went on there on stage to any audience, they, they can make, they can make, make something happen. So um, I've kind of, I think I've always had that, that mindset. It's good. It's good to have. It's like when you mentioned with the going up last at, at, all, at all these different, um, essentially training rooms because all these open mics are just training rooms you know if, if, if yes. life's a big game and it's like I, i've got my gym absolute saved on my maps as collingwood training room that's all these things are the amateur fight scene training rooms it's all training for yeah. where you're going to get to so it's like you go up last in these training rooms and it could be like you said you could feel like damn whatever and this is something i i, I mentioned to bobby when he was feeling I, I guess a bit of the same way so at some times very impatient brand new in the scene you know what i mean brand new and i'm like bro Think about it as training and just give it to yourself as a challenge. You get competitive. You're like, all right, I'm going to get up last and I'm going to make sure I bring the, I bring, I bring the roof down. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll get on last when it's supposed to be the hardest time. Everyone's tired and whatever. Yeah. And that's it. We're going we're gonna to get these last. We're going to make people crack up. Yeah. It's a mindset. Bobby, um, so, yeah, it's so funny with Bobby because, like, he, I remember he was, he was at my room. I run this, like, open mic in um, St. Kilda. I think you guys have maybe you've been there, Sam? Uh, which, which one? Uh, 29th Apartment. Yeah, so 29th Apartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, he was like, oh, bro, should I try this new bit? Like, I'm a bit nervous about it. I'm like, yeah, fucking oh. Like, it's, it's, it's kind of funny trying new bits and trying new material and stuff because a lot of the time you won't go up on stage and try a new bit because you're afraid it won't work, mm. uh, which is the mentality I kind of fell into when I started. But now, like, if I, have a, if I have a new bit, I'm like, fuck, yeah, even if it bombs. Like, because you just get tired of saying the same shit on stage every fucking night. Because essentially, you're going up on... St it's like telling a bunch of people the same story yeah. over and over and over again. So it gets boring. So you end up just kind of developing new material out of boredom. So That's <laughs> cool. It's like, yeah, it's cool you mentioned that. Because I've been... Funnily enough, I've ended up coming to so many of these um, open mics. I yeah. got to see which, uh, like, a lot of people would reuse their content a lot, and then I would yeah. see people trying differently. And I can see how some content hits differently, even though it's the same content. There's so many little nuances in there. Different audiences. Yeah. And... Oh, yeah, I, I got to tell this story about um, because it was at um, the UFC Melbourne last year, <laughs> and I ran it. Actually, I ran it. Sam, you and I ran it to each other. At the other side. Do you remember? No. We ran oh, even up. better. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you remind me, I remember. Yeah, so it was maybe there was probably like four or five fights before the main card. It was like in between fights. And because I remember this story as well, because I was talking to Bobby and he was telling me sort of about your kind of championship mindset that you have sent, where you might have a bad day in the gym or whatever, but at the end of the day, you're always about like becoming whatever UFC champion, whatever your goal is. And, and Bobby said, like, it's kind of unshakable about you. And I feel like I tasted it a little bit because when I was, I was um, going off to get food, take a piss, and I came back and I bumped into you and I could tell you Im immediately, I could tell you didn't remember my name, but you didn't try to hide it. You were just like, oh, ginger man, what's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, what's up, man? And I respected you. Like, the respect went up because you didn't pretend to, like, I would have been like, oh, what's up, bro? Like, Yeah, the worst is sitting there like, oh, hey, uh, how you going? How yeah, you didn't the finger snap. Just went, all right, with Ginger, man. And then we talked for maybe, it was like 30 seconds or a minute or something. And we both quickly, like, ran out of shit to say. And we both wanted to go off and watch the fights. And me, I would have... A lesser man, 
myself, I was just going to try to plod along and politely sort of, you know, but you were just like, all right, bro, I'll catch you. And you left. And I was like, I wanted to thank you for saving both of our fucking time. And like, it was just a great moment. <laughs> I, we like, had shit to like, do, bro. Huh? We, we had shit to do that day. Now I do remember. It was like, yeah, uh, obviously in between, but you know that you know walking at the back part of those, um, like behind all the chairs and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Arrange each other there. Funny as. We. I just wanted to thank you for saving our fucking time. And well, so, you're welcome. Like it was, it was so refreshing. Cause like, it is, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Like it's yeah. just there's so many little old sort of conversational nuances or things that you think people like to encourage certain shit. Like you got to, you're meant to say this, you're meant to say that. And it's like, dude, honestly, like if you're not going to talk to me about something worth talking about, then I'm out. I'm just out, dude. And I'm, I'm not going to even try and to hide it. I was listening to this yeah. thing about Tyson. I oh, know. Sorry. Alan Watts. Is that like, you know, Alan Watts? Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't that? watched like a ton of his stuff, but yeah. yeah no, I was listening to one last night and I've been fucking just watching my cat recently. And I just, I've always had a thing, like I fucking hate dogs. They're just messy. They smell like shit. Fuck them. But cats, I don't mind, you know? Yeah, they just do their own thing. And Alan Watts was saying, he's like, you can't hate a cat just like you can't hate a man that is um, directly and honestly selfish. Because if you're directly and honestly selfish, I'm not hiding anything. Like, you know what I'm about. And like, it's not, I'm not trying to deceive you anymore. If I'm just yeah. laying my cards out, like, this is who I am. I'm not trying to be rude about it. It's just me. Like, I'm not deceiving you. I'm not doing anything wrong by you. You yeah. know what I'm, you know what to expect when you talk to me. And if you feel any other way, then that's on you now. And yeah. I'm like, fuck yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. It's, it's a beautiful thing, honestly, isn't it? You know what I mean? Just like, being black and white, you know? Yeah, yeah. Black yeah. and white. Simple. Like, because when I go on stage, I always feel like a... Um, good thing about my act is like I come off stage and I'm the same guy that you saw on stage. Obviously I'm like accentuating and whatever aspects of my personality, but I'm still the same. I'm still the same person. Cause no, you tell that. like yeah. you see him on stage. Then you talk to him afterwards. You go, what the fuck? Yeah. Well, Did I just see yeah. like, they're like this ditzy sort of like dainty person on stage. Then they get off stage. They're like you're a fucking monster. Like you're a fucking animal. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Where was this on stage? You're swearing <laughs> up, you know, like saying all this fuck shit. You know what I mean? Like, I want to say that all. in front of the people. Yeah, yeah. facts, man. You got to be unapologetically, you like Josh used that phrase a little while back and it stuck, it stuck in my head. That's just how you got to be, you know? It's like, there's no time to be anything else. And if you're going to pander to people's desires or, or opinions or whatnot, it's like, what I realized when, you, when, you're, when you're black and white, the people that take it, in a positive way, even though there's nothing offensive about being back black and white, you're just being up front and being you. Yeah. They're people that are similar on a similar path, similar journey. They don't take things the wrong way. It's like, cool. Yeah. Comedy, comedy, comedy. It's such an amazing thing. It's so interesting seeing that whole scene. It's like, it's crazy, crazy, mm -hmm. especially something that, like you said, there's no real pathway out there, but that also opens things up. It opens things up when there's no pathway or when there's yeah. no registered pathway of like, do this and that and that because you have the freedom to like blaze your own trail, you know? Yeah. And there's like, yeah, there's no limits to what you can do on zero, like on stage. Even zero. Yeah. Um, yeah Are like, there really no limits? Can you do anything you want? Can you, can you just, can you go nude if you want? I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I remember I was doing this bit. I got this joke. Um, I start off talking about like how I like lifting weights. Mm. And the whole joke is like, I end up fucking going to a funeral and I, and I pick up the fucking coffin and it's like, oh, wow, what a deadlift. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's the fucking, that's what the joke is. And I remember I was doing that one time on stage and I started off the bit like, yeah, you know, I like lifting weights. And this woman in the audience was like, all right, show us. I was like, what the fuck? There's no weights here, you fucking idiot. <laughs> what do you want me to I think she wanted me to rip my shirt off or something. She wanted you to flash. Yeah, and I got a good rig, you know what I mean? But, like, I'm not, that's not what I'm there for. You know what I mean? Yeah, have you ever, like, this is what I thought about um, when I was watching, like, a lot of Joe Rogan stuff and then even just being at um, the stand-up nights. And I've noticed yeah. with a lot of female comics, they all sort of go for that. And maybe I haven't watched enough. But yeah. from what I've seen, they all play that card of, like, being dirty and... 
they don't give a shit and they talk about dicks and all those all sorts of stuff like that that you sort of get away with being a comic but i'm like is do people say shit that they're not okay with but they say it because it's what you're supposed they think it's what you're supposed to do like on stage yeah yeah i've probably done that like Like, but do you do things that are self-deprecating just because you know it's going to be funny Oh, hundred percent. Like I, and when I first came into the comedy scene, there was no, not none, but there was very few, like the whole stick was like, Oh, you know, I'm a virgin and I'm fucking bad with girls. And, and I was like, watching these. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not like that. You know what I mean? Like I'm pretty, you know, I'm all right with women and like, I'm pretty charismatic guy. I'm like, why, why the fuck would I try to like lean into that thing, which I'm not. And there's been a few times where I've caught myself like doing that shtick and it doesn't work. You might get some cheap laughs, but I'm like, well, that isn't, that isn't me. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm just this fucking, you know, bit of a cheeky sitco. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I've seen myself. That's it right there. That's the name of, that's the name of your fucking, of your, your <laughs> cheeky sitco. Yeah. It's funny because it's like, you do kind of have to kind of, coming to your own in comedy it, it looks like mm. you know you kind of got to find your own feet and develop your own kind of style and it's built i think when it's built off of the authentic version of yourself and the things and that's when it kind of like sticks around the best yeah and i was i was listening to this podcast i think it was the one you guys did two two ago or whatever and josh you was you were talking about the tumor in your in your knee and yeah. you were and like, hey, you're going to fight again. And you're just like, fuck it. I'll switch to Southpaw. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because it was all, it was three fighters on the podcast. And you guys were just like, you said it like it was nothing. And everyone, everyone, everyone else in the podcast was like, yeah, you know, that's what you do. But like to listen to that <laughs> who doesn't fight. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's true. We don't, I don't think about that. I sort of don't really know how people will perceive some of the things they watch or hear on the podcast. Cause I mean, it's sort of just different with, with you and me saying like we've just done this for the fucking longest time. And I mean, even saying it to Kaylee, I was sort of just like in a way sort of hinting if that would be a good idea or not. But at the same time, I was like, I'm going to do it anyway. I just want to see what she'd say, but she's just like, yeah, that's just what you fucking do. Like you're in the ring and sort yeah. it out. You know what I mean? Like, adjustment. Uh, and, and then there was a, a Isaac, when Isaac was on, he was like, yeah, you know, I put up this $1,400 wager for like a jujitsu match. And you guys are like, yeah. <laughs> it was nothing. I was sitting there like, you just can't put up $1,400 for a fucking, what jujitsu is like submission, like, like simulated death. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's putting and, money on that shit. I'm like, I'm best. $1,400 on a comic. So like I'm going to out laugh you. You can't, you know what I mean? Like, oh, fuck that. <laughs> That's how it goes. And it's funny. It shows, it shows the mindset. It does. But it's, uh, it's good. It's refreshing. I think a part of it, Josh, is that because we're kind of involved in that, um, this is just the crowd that we're in. It's just kind of how your, I don't know, how the mind works when you're in that crowd. It's good to be, that's why they, that's why they say, you know, your, your environment matters. It's always good to, have, to hang out with people like yourself, you know, have that similar mindset. And this yeah. is just how we talk. This is how we think. I know if I bounce an idea off of either of you, I know what kind of mindset it's being bounced off. It's not going to be like a, I'm like, oh, I'm a bit tired. It's not going to, I'm, I don't, Josh won't be like, oh yeah, take like a few weeks off or something. It'll be like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, <laughs> that's how it yeah, works. That's yeah. how it goes. No, that's exactly so what Kaylee said. She's like, just get on with it. And I was like, yeah. you know what? Fuck it. That's, that's all you can do really. Exactly. Yeah. But um, same with, um, it's the same with comedy. Like when you, um, what you were talking about there, Sam, like I, my little crew that I've got now, like we'll discuss bits with each other. Even now that stand up's not on, like I got a few guys that we, you know, all making content and we like send videos to each other and ask for like thoughts or mm-hmm. criticisms or whatever. Um, yeah, it just really helps. Cause yeah, you could send the, I could be sending my video to someone else who would just give me like some negative fucking, even like, not to paint my mum in a fucking bad light, because I put pretty risque shit online, your mum doesn't want you doing that. You know what I mean? Naturally. Like, your mum doesn't want you... She's Your mum naturally just wants to, you to toe the fucking line and sort of, yeah. you know... That, that, that's her job. Yeah. 
Exactly. Um, but if I did that all the time, I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have any success with comedy because it's unfortunate that I'm a fucking, like I'm a, I'm not a clean comic sort of thing in my head. Cause to be a clean comic, I just see the pathway would kind of be um, a lot easier and it would be less resistance in a way. But I'm, but then it comes back to it. Like I'm actually thankful that um, I got to go through some, uh, 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 some different barriers. But yeah. I don't, if, if, I had to, if I had to pick, I probably wouldn't pick being a dirty comic, but it's just who I'm inclined to be. It's who I am. So I, I got to you, you accept it and you run yeah. the journey. The reason, okay, I think I'm starting to see more and more, whether it's just comedy or whether it's fighting or any other unique vocation where it's so difficult um, to find your feet and go forward. It's just yeah. the fact that that difficulty is where that kind of, is where that bond is, you know, because the journey itself is where you develop everything like that. Running into the resistance that you're talking about, you're like, oh, there is an easier path if I do this, but then it's not me. It's like, no, no, no I've got to stick with me and just continue to do that and push through it. But as you go through that, that journey, I wonder how it's been for you. Have you seen how things start to slowly but surely kind of line up? You see a little bit of a, of a pathway kind of open up or you get a little bit of an inkling that, okay, this is kind of how things, this is the direction things are kind of heading in. Um, yeah, definitely this past month as well, sort of with like, I guess the validation of getting a, a good following mm -hmm. online. Um, yeah. And I, I can kind of, cause the, the goal has always been putting online content to get an audience so I can do shows. Mm -hmm. So I've sort of started to see that. Um, and even just like when I first started and I was, I'd try a vulgar fucking crazy bit on stage and it would bomb terribly and everyone look at me like I'm crazy. Um, when I can, when I had those clicks where I would actually go and attempt those bits and it was, it would come out, you know, half the audience might be fucking shocked, but I was still cracking up the other half. So just like those little things that, well, just the first time you have a good bit of crowd work, like crowd works, like such this fucking, or well, first time you get heckled. I remember when, um, when I first started, cause I, I think I'm, I just get heckled a lot because of the type of person I am and, I, and I'm just, you know, I'm a, I you rip them to shreds, but <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't used to, cause I used to just kind of react with, with all the aggression I had, but none of the funniness okay. sort of thing. So I remember I was at, it was like first six months of comedy. I was at like Footscray at a gig. And this, there's like, there's a type of heckler that will just talk. They're not even talking related to what you're saying. This guy was talking and I just like snapped out of like my act. And I was like, I was like, mate, you don't have to fucking talk. Like I just, I was just real aggressive, real <laughs> awkward. And then I tried to snap into my act and be like, well, that was a bit weird. And I could tell the whole audience like, this is just fucking bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> like, Different everyone off, off, like, it was just weird. I, I made the whole scene awkward. And then I was driving my brother's car back home and the fucking radio wasn't working. And I was like, I was like, I remember banging the roof of the car, like, cause I didn't want to be alone with my, my own thoughts of like processing what the fuck just yeah. happened. Um, and then there was, and yeah, I just kind of gradually got better at dealing with hecklers. And there was this one dude, um, is that another gig? He got on stage and grabbed the microphone off me. Oh, dude. And he was just, this cunt was probably like six, six, two, six, three, just big black dude. And I was like, I was fucking terrified when it happened. And then I actually saw the same guy at that gig, maybe like two or three months later. And he heckled me and I dealt with it a lot better. Cause he's like, Oh, you got to make me laugh. You got to make me laugh. And I was like, well, actually don't, this is a free show. Like I was <laughs> say nothing. And what I was like, what do you want your fucking money back? And he's like, oh, okay. So I kind of earned his respect. And then the next joke I did, I got a laugh off him. And I remember like, that was like a real, I didn't even kill or anything, but I just remember like skipping home or like dancing home or whatever, just like, like, cause I had that little, I was yeah. like, I that little thing. That now I can. Yeah. That's, that's how that's it works. Win. It's like inspiring, you know, you, Josh, you like, you land that certain thing or that certain puzzle piece falls in place. You might've had maybe not the best night every other round. But you're like, okay, what I found is for myself, whenever those little moments happen, to latch onto them and draw as much positivity out of it as, as possible, let myself feel as good as possible um, over every little thing. 
yeah. same thing, I guess, in comedy would help to be like, yeah, fuck, let me latch onto that. That was a good moment because it's all just puzzle pieces sliding into place. You know, when you are out there booking out shows eventually and everything's all working for you, all these moments now will be the best moments that you'll look back on and laugh with Alessio about and all the different yeah. characters you ran into, all the fucking struggles. You're like, bro, what the fuck? Were we, we were seriously running around for fucking room to room, bombing <laughs> in this car, this car's happening. It's like, these are, yeah. these are those moments. But it, the thing is, it's kind of like, when I say that that first domino piece gets flipped when you had that moment watching Bill Burr, it means that domino effect has already run. And that, that last domino that you think is the last domino, in effect, it's already fallen when you flick that first domino. It's just about, mm. are you going to stick through the whole thing? You know, you got to stick through that whole thing. And along the way, you get those little, little puzzle pieces, those little gems, like, oh, okay, that's how I deal with the heckler. This works for me. This is my kind of... But then there's all the other little shit times. You bomb here, you bomb from there. But I really, really believe it because um, I've seen, just by looking at the people that have made it to the top in their industries, no one escapes that. Those things are just like those little tests of who really wants it. When they say how bad we want it, it's not really like a... Maybe it's a motivational thing, but that's just... That's the determining factor. Because if you want to, it's like you stick through all those little shitty moments and then that final domino yeah. fucking flicks over at the end. You book that show out and it's like, fuck. Yeah, and that like, desire, fuck. like... Yeah. Um, yeah, when, you, I, like, when you're doing fucking eight or nine shows a, a night or whatever... Oh, sorry, a week. And you're working. I mean, it's the same with you guys. Like, you're mm. just grinding. You're busy all the time. Like, it's like... It's even hard to fucking maintain a relationship. And, like, um, I, I don't see... It, my friends from Canberra, like a lot, like it's like, it's a big, you know, this, these are big sacrifices that you make. So it's kind of like that. And that makes you keep pushing because you're like, all right, well, I already sacrificed four years of, of pretty much nights of going out <laughs> every night doing stand up. Why would I ever stop now? You know yeah. what I mean? I'm pretty fucking in it. You know, you've got to be in it long enough to win it. That's the second part. You know, say in it to win it. So you've got to be in it long enough to win it. <laughs> yeah, be fucking bombing on stage every fucking night. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, what's it like bombing? The first time, it's such a huge hit to your ego because oh. you, because you, you know, you, you do comedy, so you think you're a funny person, obviously. Otherwise, why the fuck would you do it? Um, and then when you realize that, oh shit, maybe I'm not as funny as I thought it was. Like it's this huge, I don't know, wash over you. But then there's like all these other different types of bombs. Like you can have like a tepid bomb where like you kind of, shit's kind of working, but you're not really cracking them. There's ones where you can have like just the audience fucking hate you. Like I've had that. There's this one in a uh, gig in Yarraville we all used to do. And it was just, oh man, it was just, hateful sort of bogans like the kind of sort of inner city so they're entitled so they're like they have that energy of like make me laugh dickhead you know what mm, i mean fuck annoying yeah and i had just a few there was this one night this lady <laughs> just tore me to shreds just <laughs> tore me to fucking shreds <laughs> and i i was like cut for the for the whole week and then i saw her at the gig again the next week and she came and apologized to me and i was like I was like, no, don't apologize because I deserve that sort of thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Because it wouldn't have happened if I handled it better. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't deserve it. So, yeah, all those, all those, they just make you better, really. But it's fucking weird. It's very weird bombing. It's just yeah. a yeah, <laughs> but, but that's yeah. where that, that's where that character, it's like the same, again, we keep drawing those parallels with fighting, but there's something about comedy, you're in that spotlight, you know? If you bomb, bang, right there. It's like if you fight and you lose, it's like you lose under the bright lights with everyone there looking at you. All of us yeah. have, have either bombed or lost. So it's like we all know what it's like, you know? And it's just, it's so, um, it's so interesting. It's not really an experience. It's a full on experience. You know, life is like so many different experiences, but this is like whatever little loss you might experience playing a game with your friends or whatever, times that by everything. That's like, deal with that. Deal with it deal with that that's why it's so unique you know comedy fighting bombing it's like what, what's it like um like fuck what, what's it like winning and losing a fight because sam i remember when i first followed your instagram i think the one of the first clips i saw was like you flying knee <laughs> knocking out a guy now, like, i can't even imagine like what that must feel like 
<laughs> man, winning is like um, it, it's for, for me when I've won. Actually, I've never actually been asked that. But when when I've won, it's not like a bit of a relief of like it's it's like what I've expected, you know. So it's yeah. like that. But in that expectation, you know that there's some you're gonna have to do some shit for this to happen. But you expect it to happen. All right, I'm gonna win. I gotta do this. And then in the fight, it's hard to explain in the fight. In the fight, it's just a fight, eh? But when you at the very end of it and you've won, yeah, it just feels so, so damn good. It's like that, exactly like that moment of having that, you know, that fifty dollar note. It's yeah, like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar, similar to like that because it's that, that's it's that affirmation, that confirmation of fuck, you know, that's good. But the knockout was um, was unique, was unique experience. That was so weird watching it happen it felt like i was watching it happen like um when crazy. you were Cause, fighting yeah because like you, what do you mean like watch like it was, out of body experience or like my first loss was this loss that everyone was like you won whatever but i'm like no give it to me as a loss i'm going to take it as a loss so it gives me that fire to go on and that was only two weeks prior and this fight wasn't um this fight wasn't booked yet i took that fight you know a little bit on short notice so when I lost, a big reason why was because I let myself be pushed and kept onto the fence for so long. Even though I yeah. was one doing the damage, I dropped the guy. I had him in submission attempts when I hit the ground. It's like you can't let yourself be there because if it comes to the judges, you might cop a shit decision. So yeah. this was like third round. I'm on the fence. And I remember thinking to myself, I just look up and I see the time. It was like 25 seconds. And I was like, I remember just getting annoyed in my head. I was like, is this going to happen again? I'm going to be stuck on the, like on the fence again. And it, rings out and I got to see him it's a decision and that's when I hit I throw two like ugly punches like you don't want to throw punches in that position because that's where people can um on the fence drag you up and take the back yeah. I was like whatever like 25 seconds ago I let go of the wizard Josh and I was like pop pop twice and then I'm like this knee I had been visualizing you know so long <laughs> yeah. and I was like okay he, uh, I threw one knee, which connected, which people didn't see, but that probably really helped set everything up. And then when we stepped off the fence, it was like I was watching it happen. I'm looking, I'm like, oh man, I, I heard him with that knee. And I remember stepping back and I'm like, okay, he's going to come forward. Bang, I just jumped. And I don't even know, man, I can't even explain. It. It's, weird, it's, one of it. it's just, shoo, bang, beautiful smack. And then I land. And I'm just like looking at him stumbling around and falling and I just put my hand up and walk. And it was just like, it was just fucking crazy. Just movie <laughs> shit, bro. <laughs> that moment was weird. But the moment of like full elation and everything was when I won my um, Park the Hex, like the amateur one. Yeah. That was just pretty sick. I had everyone that, I had so many people that I really cared about there. Josh jumped in the cage. Josh yeah. snuck into the cage. <laughs> Fucking crazy. It was so shit, good. Bro. It was like, <laughs> bro, I was literally, I was jumping through crowds. I was stepping on people's arms and fucking whatever to come through. Cause I'm like, he's going to knock him out. If he knocks him out and wins the title, I'm jumping the cage. And I remember <laughs> as you won, like you were on top and he didn't quite get the finish. I'm like, I'm fucking doing it anyway. And I remember climbing on the judges' <laughs> table. I climbed on the judges', judges tables and I kicked his fucking thing off. And he's like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, fuck it. And I kept running. And I just sort of stumbled. I'm like, I'm getting in now. And then I just fuck come yeah. through and I was stoked to be, I was like, fuck yeah. Like we did, like you did this, you know what I mean? Cause I fucking, you know I mean? I've been there for ages watching this sort of shit. And it's sort of you, it's exactly that you expect to win. You expect mm -hmm. things will happen the way they're going to, I fucking knew it was going to happen. But it's like when they do, it's a different sort of feeling. Cause you, you know, it's going to happen, but to see it and feel it, it's, I don't know. You're like, fuck yeah. Like I, it's a, a proof to yourself again you know and proof is hard to explain it until you feel it mm. but yeah but yeah it's the most there's no feeling like it so it's like I, it's hard for me to you know to really put into words josh will feel the same but so fucking good can't even explain it <laughs> but <laughs> get fired up now but, i'm thinking about it bro oh so good man so good <laughs> but the yeah, fighting dude. is the best part just the fighting is the best part. Like right now it has been so long, especially with everything going on. It's like, I can feel it. Like this next fight, whatever happens, I'm so keen. I'm so yeah. fucking keen because there's been so much work that we've been doing. Like even on the low, we've been training the whole time. So the leveling up has occurred. It's like, let's just go now. Let's go. Yeah, I feel the same with going on stage, bro. I'm just yeah. Like, Fuck, I want to have a mic in my hand. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
Like, but if you feel like doing like a, uh, a live show or something online? Dude. I was thinking that in my head. Fuck it, nah. Nah, uh, I've seen like screen recordings of people doing it. It just looks, it looks fucking terrible. Like you say yeah. a joke and then there's like a one second delay on your laugh. Like, <laughs> yeah, just, and there's like eight people in I'd rather just wait and just do content. True. I did hear Rogan talk about it once and he said that you can't feel the vibe that people are giving off and it doesn't yeah. work. You're, like, you're not the same if you can't vibe off other people's. Yeah, because even like sometimes you're not even getting a laugh. You're just kind of leading, leading up to your punchline or whatever and people like smiling at you and sort of like, giving you energy sort of thing yeah that makes a big difference or even like even if it's the opposite like if they're like i kind of looking at you hating you while you're trying to make them laugh it's pretty funny like if you actually just think about it like it's like man i'm trying to entertain this guy he hates me like, <laughs> <laughs> true yeah man some people are just fucking assholes oh fuck that's it but if i make that i'd rather make that fucking asshole laugh than everyone else in this building you know what i mean is it like, like a way of like getting him like, back? What was that? Is it kind of like a way of like getting him back? Yeah, and just like you, f- you really got to earn it. Mm. Like same with that story where I said that guy heckled me. Then the next show I got him to laugh. Like that was like the same exact thing. Just yeah. so satisfying. Like it must be the same as like submitting a guy who's real good at like his things jujitsu, and you're like, all right, well fuck you, I'm taking you to your world. <laughs> and I'm you in your world. You know that I mean? was my whole mindset. Well, we, well, I didn't know. Oh, first, I answered the question. You didn't answer the whole question. You said also winning and losing. Losing was like, yeah. um, losing was in the moment. It was like, because yeah, I expected to win every time. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I expected to win and I didn't win. But it was, I don't feel like I've had the chance to fully embrace the loss because I didn't have, I didn't get, give myself time. Like, on that same night, I was with Simon in the back. Right after, like, all right, what do I do? What do I here, 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 here? But like, we had lights to catch. We people had shit to do, so we had to go, and I had to stay there um, overnight. Just thinking in my head, it was just like defenses, ways that I could have um, won. And then as soon as I got back home, I didn't even. I literally got off the plane, went home to to like shower and, and eat, and then I went straight to my friend's gym and just worked for about an hour and a half on the wall exact yeah. position that I, that, that I feel was what um, let me down in that fight. And then I went straight to absolute right after that. All, this is all on the same day. Touchdown, bang, bang, bang. It was yeah. like I didn't have much time to think about the loss. I was just like, let's fucking fix this problem. Unbelievable that it yeah. happened. And then literally I'm at the gym, just staying, training, training. And then um, suddenly I just – oh, Simon pulls me in. My head coach pulls me in. Look, we've got this last-minute fight coming up in the Gold Coast. You want to take it or well, you have to cut weight again blah, blah blah i'm like fuck let's go let's go there and then um that fight the guy was a, was a black belt was a brown belt he got his black belt now he was a brown belt at the time which is pretty high up there in jiu-jitsu and i remember saying like when i that's what i want to do when i go i want to go to the ground so that i can you know just beat this guy there in his own game and i did when I was on the yeah. ground i had him in the triangle um i passed his guard he never could hold me down like yeah it was good yeah fuck it that's but yeah, that's, that's the whole loss thing. It's like I just didn't give myself much time to really feel anything about it. Because you just went again, almost straight. Yeah. And I just, from then, it was only like maybe four or five days before I got booked again. And in those four or five days, all I could think about was um, getting good at being on the fence. Because um, I knew it was obvious that's where everyone is going to want to put me. You know, don't want to strike, let's go on the fence. I'm like, all right, so now yeah. we know that's where we're going to work on. And now it's like, if I go to the fence in my next fight, you'll see me smiling. Put me there because that's like <laughs> you work so you <laughs> worked that position before. so much. Oh, dude, and I've worked it now with some top top guys. Like, there's some killers at the gym that yeah, I go these guys. Other guys aren't aren't gonna be able to give me any problem. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, that's like the same as um when you do two gigs a night and the first one shit, the second one you're like fuck it, dude. I've already yeah, been, like, you know what I mean. I don't care. <laughs> and you have a good set because you don't give a fuck. Yeah. So you're up there with that fun energy. Yeah, dude. That's all you can do. It's all about that whole, um, the whole victim and opportunity mindset because it's so easy to play the victim and start blaming on other shit, especially for fights. It's so, so easy to come up with. No one has ever walked into the octagon or ring being 100%. I can almost guarantee you that. They've yeah. got some injury, something happens in training. 
they wake up with shit, something going on. Or even just something in life. Something. Life, yeah, their head's not, like, whatever, or their nerves is fucked. No one's ever been 100%. And it's like, for you to even say anything about that and start blaming on shit, is like, dude, what are you doing? Like, it's like Sean O'Malley, Sean O'Malley with his loss. And he's talking about on the back, like my, like I had this thing wrapped around my leg. It was real tight. And I remember, I remember telling my coach, like, oh, this is real tight. And I was like, bro, you copped a leg kick. All right. Yeah. And you went down and you got TKO onto the next, <laughs> onto the next. But yeah. he's talking about <laughs> this and that. Man. Was he saying he's 12 and 0 still? Mentally oh. undefeated? Yeah, he did. He's, it's his wife. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same as like, there, there's some cunts I know who were like, They'll bomb. Like, you watch him on stage and you're like, man, this cunt's having a shit set. This is pretty funny. And then he comes off stage. He's like, yeah, that was pretty good, eh? <laughs> Listen, bro, what the, fuck did, what the fuck was I watching? You know what I mean? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, and, and it's it, such and a it hard... Takes, it takes away from your, your wins. It does, yeah. It's, it's hard to like, admit well, that. Let's put an asterisk against everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. True. Yeah. you got to sort of, it's the hardest thing in the world to do objectively, but you really have to just lay it out on, like, if you were looking at yourself third person almost and be like, as a character, you're a loss and just fucking admit it, man. Just, you got to say like, I did this wrong. I fucked up here. Sorry. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. I know what it is. And then next mm. time it is, I start to get them work done and you fix it. You know what I mean? It's like, there should never ever be something that's lingering. If it's fucking lingering, then you haven't addressed it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you got to you have fought in the first place, probably. Yeah, exactly. You really need what time. A factor. A hundred percent. Well, like I've been sort of trying to do this lately and I'm always, I don't schedule it at certain times, but I just make sure it gets done a few times throughout the week. Whether it's like, if I'm struggling to fall asleep or whenever, and I just get a, a moment to myself and I'll just start thinking, like really analyzing and I've done this a hundred times over on paper, but I just start to analyze like if I'm someone else was to look at me and, and say like, what are you projecting out? Like, how do I get perceived by others? And is it the same way that I want to be perceived or is it the same way I perceive myself? And if it's not, then it's like, I'm doing something wrong. Cause most of the time I think it's that in my own head, I think that I've got these fucking mad ideas that no one's thought about and I'm smart as shit. And then you say one thing and everyone's like, yeah, dude, that's fucking basic. And I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> but it's like, you need to start. Cause if I think that I've got these things in my head, then I'm not saying them. So now I know that's the problem. Right. So it's like, okay, I've got to start voicing more and more because if you never voice an idea in your head, this is a lot of people's problems. You're going to start to say to yourself, it's the best thing ever. But the minute you put it out there to get critiqued, now you have to prove it. And if you get, if you put it out there and someone shits on it and you get sad, well, you fucked up. You know what I mean? Like you got to put you're, it out. There. You're literally describing like the process of coming up with a joke and, and trying it. That's the same thing. It's exactly the same. Cause you come up with an idea and then you go, all right, this is funny. Let me go try it on stage. And then it might be, you know, it might be really good. Um, you know, it might be a good thought, a good idea and you, you execute it well. Or fuck, most of the time I try a joke, like it's shit. Yeah. So you get that that little feedback and it just it's just all about like how much um like of your ego you attach to it, I guess. Yeah. You just go, Oh, this is just a silly idea I came up with. Let me try it on stage. Oh, it didn't work. All right. And then you rip on yourself for how shit it was. Yeah. And then it's like you did it's not it's like the joke wasn't even bad. Because you just you just took it in stride, made fun of yourself. And then you go on to the next joke. Well, when you look at everything, when you zoom out and you go, all right, this is, my, this is the journey that I want to be on from point A, let's say from point A to point B is world champion or point A to point B is selling out shows. It's like yeah. everything along the way, this is why when I say how bad you want it is the most important thing because everything along the way is just testing that. If you have that little fuck up and if you don't actually want this thing that you say you want as much, that will be enough to be like, I guess, fuck it, I'm shit, it's not good, whatever, move yeah. on. But if you do want it, all they become is just instructions. That's all. <laughs> you fuck up, yeah. all right, I learned that about this. Okay, on to the next, on to the next. It's just all parts of the puzzle. And it's just cool or like funny shit to look, to look back on. Yeah. Like, it's, um, yeah. It's good you got that little crew growing and it's like, uh, I would yeah, it's great, man. Stick, stick with it because that's another important part. When you find real... What I found when you find real genuine people that 
genuinely care about you and you genuinely care about them, it's even better if you're on a similar journey. Fuck, stick with that. Because that's so rare. You know how many like floaty little acquaintances and relationships there are going on out there when you find something as unique as that not only pursuing something similar but also same vibe genuine care there both ways it's like fuck stick with that run with that it's like it's so valuable um, because yeah it's so valuable going off with like what you were saying Sam about how you that position you were vulnerable in you just trained at a fuckload with people who were really strong in that position I feel like we kind of you should be doing that in comedy sort of off stage because our crew, fuck, we rip on each other. It's, it's fucking constant. Like when we're at gigs or whatever, like it just ripping on, it's, it's never ending. Um, well, I how the hell you put up with so much energy to take out. What was that? It's so like, it's like me hanging out with, with Bobby and I think to yeah. myself, all the, I, don't, I wonder how these comics just hang out with each other, you know, all the time. It's constant ripping, but it's good because then, like, when you go on stage, if someone's mean to you or whatever, it's like it's nothing. Yeah. And it's, it's, stuff, it's, it's funny watching um, Bobby hang out with you, Sam, because, Sam, you sort of carry yourself with, like, this, it, like this sick cunt air, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like a good presence. And, and then you see, like, Bobby will just fucking rip on you. And, and you can see, like, if anyone else said the shit that he's saying, you'd be, like, looking at him. But it's because it's, it's Bobby saying, and then he's your boy, and he's and, and he knows it. That's the worst part. Yeah, he knows it. So he he, it's the most disrespectful thing because it's like <laughs> everyone knows that like, you want to hold yourself to a high standard, and Bobby comes along and goes, "Fuck this cunt," and you're like, Sh- "Look at your head, Bobby. What are you saying?" Oh, but it's good, and it's good that he does that. To be honest, it's like it's good to have it's good to have that. But <laughs> fuck, you know, Bobby cracks me up. Man. <laughs> It's it's like, it's it, if your boys aren't going to be honest with you, no one is. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. But yeah, it, it's also outside of that. It's like Bobby knows that. I'll so, tell you what, though. When we first wore, and I didn't know him that well, but yeah. we had some problems. Like, you can't really talk <laughs> shit. I remember getting physical with him. Like, we had to, <laughs> he was working somewhere and some, some, some funny shit happened. And then at the end of that night, I remember being like, you know what? I'm going to have to just let Bobby do this every single time. <laughs> then that, I can't hang out with him. And I'm like, and I like him. So I'm going to hang out with him. So I'm like, fuck, I'm just going to have to let this happen every single time. That leeway, yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Well, what do you think about, like, stepping away from comedy for a second? What do you think about, and, like, you can go as deep as you want with this, but what do you think about the nature and reality of life? Well... I grew up like a Catholic or sort of um, Catholic school. And, but my, my parents aren't really like super religious. Like my dad's like Church of England, which is pretty much fucking atheist. Like it's like the laziest <laughs> denomination of any religion possible. And then my mom's Catholic, but she kind of, like we never really went to church or whatever that much. Um, and then when I was like, I kind of just always felt like, at that time, I felt like religion was, like, when I was, like, 14, 15, I just felt like it was kind of bullshit. And then I became, like, this sort of angsty fucking atheist little 16-year-old. Um, <laughs> and then I don't know what really changed. I kind of started, like, getting maybe, like, reading about Buddhism or whatever when I was, like, 18. I had no idea about meditation or, or anything. Um, and then when I was about 19 or 20, I read this, I read this book by... Um, Aldous Huxley, he was the guy who wrote Brave New World. I don't know if you guys know about that, that book. No. It's like- I know pretty, the book, I don't forget about what it's about. It's, it's like very similar to 1984. Like it was like okay. written around the same time period. It's about like dystopian. Orwellian type, dystopian yeah. type shit, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's kind of like the parallel to that. It was written about the same time. And this guy, Aldous Huxley, the author, he wrote this book called Doors of Perception. And it was, it was kind of the first time a Western academic had t- talked about um, taking psychedelics because he took like mescaline and then it's just, he wrote like 150 page essay. Mescaline. About it. Yeah. Mescaline. It's like a psychedelic pretty much. Okay. Um, like it's similar, like peyote or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the cat. Yeah. 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 People, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone at Toll that did that at Toll. Yeah. <laughs> well, at Toll you did it. Yeah, yeah. He was. I thought he was talking shit to us. He was on the break. He's like, "Man, 
this thing like you talk to ghosts, you talk to like ghosts when I did it. I'm like, bro, I don't give a fuck. I don't know. I'm not doing that. I'm here to fucking work. And then he goes, yeah, I'm going to do something. Him and one of the other boys went out and did it. And yeah, they got fired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro. Don't get me but, started on the heads that you meet in the warehouses. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, sorry, don't get the warehouses. Yeah, yeah. We'd be still... just, it'd be the same as working in kitchens and shit. Yeah. Are you a chef? Oh, I know. I'm a cook. I don't want to call myself a chef. I don't want to insult chefs. My <laughs> <is like that. laughs> but, um... Yeah, oh, yeah, keep going. yeah, so I, re- I read this book, yeah, called Opening uh, or Just Doors of Perception. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, like, because I've never done psychedelics or anything. And then I read this book called Opening the Doors of Perception, which was like a modern analysis of the original book that was written maybe like five, ten years ago. And it was pretty much breaking it down, like um, how there's this thing called a Huxleyan spectrum, right? And it's pretty much, so it starts off with like, um, it's like a spectrum of mental illnesses that parallel like psychedelic experiences. So the start of the spectrum, you got like autism and like um, epilepsy, like low level um, mental illnesses like that. And then it gets like further and further to like schizophrenia and um, what's the other one? Fucking like old people get um, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty much paralleled with, um, psychedelics. So pretty much what happens, like, I don't know if you guys already know this, but like when you, when you're just living now sober, your brain's just geared towards like surviving pretty much. Cause that's what we evolved to do. So you, you're just looking for shapes and like movement and, um, that's your whole brain's wired to, but when you take like psychedelics or, or you have like autism or any of these things, it opens these doors into like changing your, your, um, your perception. So I remember I took acid when I was like maybe four years ago now. And I just remember kind of experiencing that, like seeing like, I remember looking, I put peanut butter on toast. I'm like, fuck, I don't know if peanut butter had 13 colors, bro. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like this is crazy. So there's got to be looking at my tongue in the mirror, like what the fuck? How trippy. Holy so shit. yeah. So I, I, that's when I kind of started thinking like, all right, there might be more than, you know, what I summed up the world to be when I was like 16 or whatever. So yeah, what was your question again? Fuck. Yeah, I thought <laughs> yeah, I was saying the nature of reality. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely, there's just, there's some fucking vibe going on or something. Yeah. yeah so I get, I, I can't with you on that. Like a little bit different, but. You can't have, you can't, well, I don't want to say you can't, but I think an experience with psychedelics would leave anyone definitely to saying that hmm. there is something out, there's something going on, you know, there's something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. the way you put it. it. I took, uh, I went to Strawberry Fields, like a music festival. It was sick. Mm. I did, me and my whole little fucking stand up crew, we did stand up there at this music festival. Oh, yeah. Oh, you did stand up at Strawberry Fields? Yeah, dude, it was, it was incredible. That's wow. cool. But yeah, I, I took acid one, on one of the days. And I, ever since, I feel like I've, I've got a different re- relationship with trees. Like just the way I view them and everything. Because when I was, when I was, when I felt my, I never felt like I was having a bad trip. But anytime I was sort of having like weird thoughts. Yeah, I would just look back at the trees and I would, I would feel calm. And even now, like, I just fucking look at trees differently. Like, Bro. Just, it, it, I, I'm out my window now and I just kind of, I look for now the pattern that the leaves and the tree make against the sky. And I'm looking for the shapes in between. I don't know. Yeah, dude. I'm with you, bro. I'm, I'm, with you. I'm with you. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm with you 100%. It's like, I remember saying to a friend of mine, maybe it was, maybe I said it to you, Josh, or maybe I said it to, to Bobby. I said, after having done it, whatever dose of whatever I did, I remember saying, dude, you can see why people hug trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I you tell me. Me. I'm like, I can see how these tree huggers become a thing. I'm like, they would have taken it a bit further than where I would have took it, but the peace and whatnot and the and the, <laughs> and the wonder you get from looking at, at these trees. Now it's like I've, it's daily. Today I just finished a cold dip and I was walking up with my mate Oz, went and got a coffee, and 
I was just, again just looking at these trees, and it's just something about them, bro. It's like anyone listening to this will be like, these guys are cool. <laughs> Dude, I, but, when I was at that festival, yeah. we were just chilling in this like tea lounge sort of thing in the middle of the day, and we I think I, we were doing yoga or whatever. Then afterwards, we were just all chilling out, just like a bunch of like half my little crew and then like some randoms. And this chick, right? She's sit like this little Asian girl. She's got some like bandages on her. And she starts telling our little group about how last night she fucked a tree. Yeah. Yeah. She like mounted this like stump or tree thing. And it like. <laughs> <laughs> just she was just telling us. Away. <laughs> hell. Yeah. And it was like, like rubbing her asshole a little bit and like <laughs> scratches and shit. Like she full showed her. She was like bandaged up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <dude>. uh, <laughs> oh man! So yeah, that that's definitely taking tree hugging to another fucking man. Yeah. Well, go I was there. thinking um a little bit more differently about the nature of reality than that. <laughs> but like, I agree. I absolutely agree that it's all connected, and I can see why people, especially. You know, someone said something very similar. I never heard of this Huxley, Huxley spectrum before, but it does make a lot of sense because um, someone else used to tell me that he's like, dude, I think that people with autism or some sort of mental illness have either, you know, either it's legit and they're seeing things differently because even like, for example, we had one growing up, right? And he just didn't give a fuck. If he was done with the conversation, he was done. He would just... I mean, like, I used to see him at the station every day after I'd finished work or whatever. And he would just come around doing a lapse saying like, hey, my name's Matt and just shaking everyone's hand. And he would ask him the same question. He'd be like, do you like swimming? And if they said no, he wouldn't say, okay, oh, that sucks. Or he'd just turn around and walk away because he didn't want to do <laughs> He just loved swimming. And he, I just fucking respected that so much that he didn't give a shit anymore. He, you didn't say what he wanted and he was done. And he would just, we got nothing to talk about. And if he said yes, he would tell him. He would tell you all about what he thinks about swimming. And then when he was done, he would be like, "Can I have a hug?" And you'd either say yes or no. Didn't matter what you said. And he'd be like, "Cool, yeah." And that was it. I don't know what the fuck, but I was like, "That's so cool that they don't give a shit like that. They're just in their own world in a way." way to be, they yeah. have different. It's like, it's like some of the filters. Some of the filters that we have. You know these social filters of like yeah. going through. So it's like some. Of, they don't have some of those. It's almost a blessing, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, dude, it's almost refreshing because it's like, you know what? You can't even, what do you even say to that? It's just like, fuck, dude, you're doing your own thing. Like, how am I to say that it's a bad thing what you're experiencing? Because, you know, um, have you heard of CRISPR? No. So I think I might have mentioned this before, but I get really into some, some fields and this is one of them. So CRISPR is a gene editing tool that enables you to, edit your genes and not only can you edit your own genes you can edit your kids genes right and this has been right. some movie Gattaca and we've talked about this I love that fucking movie dude Gattaca. it's dude it's I real life Gattaca it's, but at the moment we have um, there's like a hierarchy it sort of looks like this but it's labelled differently right this is about urgency but it's labelled like this right so you have yeah. yourself you have your future generations you have uh, I don't know what the word is but it's Editing, edits you can do to yourself that won't affect your bloodline and edits you can do to affect your future bloodlines. And at the moment, it's almost illegal in every country that you're not allowed to edit certain extents of your future bloodlines, right? Because otherwise you make, um, they call them like luxury babies. So if, I make, if I'm rich as fuck and I can afford this technology, I'm basically making a superhuman that's going to be born way better than everyone else. And now we have a disparity in our, in our economic system, right? Yeah, it's like in like, um, they almost kind of like uh, cyborgs. Yeah, in a way, for sure. They're just, they're enhanced. They're better. They're like a better yeah. human. And the big argument that came up was because with this technology, you can start cutting out people with autism, Down syndrome. Uh, I don't know what the word is, but midgets. You can start cutting out all that shit. You, <laughs> yeah, legit, you can cut out redheads. Yeah, you can kick everything, dude. And it's like... <laughs> it's like As if we're not on the ropes already, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. People are just like, fuck them to get rid of them. But it's like, who's to say what's a bad thing and what's not? Because there's a lot of people that with, for example, with this guy in um, politics, he was saying about, he has Down syndrome and he's like, 
who's to say that I've got a problem and who's to say that I'm stupid than you? It's like, you don't know what it's like or what I think about. And who's to say that this is a bad thing that you need to get, make extinct because that's the thing. Like you do it and you make it extinct. And now we have to wait for natural selection to occur later on down the field if that does. But if you keep making these babies along the, the genome, right? So you get 10 years down the track, 10 generations down the track, and you've made them all modified. There's yeah. no room for error anymore. You're never going to see certain things come back again. It's like you're making races of human extinct. And it's like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, well, and it's like, I don't know, just when, you, when you're dating different women and stuff, like I find the beautiful thing is like the differences between them. Like if a chick's got a little bit of hair, like just above her arsehole or something like, it's like, fuck, <laughs> this chick didn't have this. This is great. It's not too much hair. You know what I mean? But it's nice amount of fucking hair. It's like that or something. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't, why do we want to get rid of that? that make is beautiful. I'm going to make this out. Yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess it's that. <laughs> <laughs> bit of asshole hair. Hey, you got to do that. Bro. Cut that oh. out. There's someone out there that likes that. You know what I mean? You're going to miss out. Fuck yeah. Dude, the imagine <laughs> chicks have, that have ranger fetishes. I would have never oh, fucking no. known. You know what I mean? True. That is true. It blows your mind. <laughs> 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 well, you know, the other thing I was, I was thinking, someone also said to me, he's like, what if people with all sorts of mental illnesses have just convinced us that they need help just so that we're their slaves. He's like, really, they're smarter than all of us. And they've conned us into doing shit for them. And I was like, Pfft. That's the best Dude. conspiracy theory ever. <laughs> that, <laughs> is. that really, that one really one fucking one. is. They're Dude. the ones that started COVID. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, we've completely gone off the rails. Of fucking podcast. Imagine that. They've planned this since day one. And then every time there's another kid. But then again, how do they, when do they get to them? Nah, you know what? Maybe we'll just leave it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that we might actually get our first hate mail after this episode. And <laughs> That's good. That means you got listeners, boys. True. Back. Back. <laughs> oh, fuck it. Yeah. All right. I think we've been almost two hours. I'm pretty stoked with how it's gone. Yeah, that was good, boys. We'll wrap it up. What, what's um, a party message from Hugh Robertson? Um... Shave your balls, not your fucking pubes on your crotch. Mm. Looks like a looks like an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Perfect. Done. That's it. That's the quote. That's the episode. That's gonna be the episode quote. <laughs> I'm standing by that, boys. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Thank you. You're obviously Legend, bro. Legend. Absolute uh, pleasure. That was fucking super fun. So cool to do yeah, a podcast. Thanks, thanks for having me fun. on, boys. It's hey, a, we're all gonna come. We're gonna come to down. Be. We'll bring the team down when when things are back. Yeah, and fuck us. Yeah, yeah. And any hecklers, just leave it to us. That's the <laughs> you gotta come any on. Any hecklers, chuck them out. Yeah. I'll just kick a chair out or whatever. Alright, <laughs> 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 bro. Legend. Done. Cheers, brother. Take care. Thank you, boys.